So what's going on? Yeah. Uh, you'll have to ignore the disheveled. No, the more than usual disheveled look. I uh, I can't keep up with the snow, man. <laughs> yeah. So I went out. Uh, I went out this morning, and I probably took off uh, six inches uh, this morning. Um, and then I did the walks kind of up and down the street a ways, and I came back, and I had another inch on my driveway, so I cleared it again. Um, and then just as I was about to put away the snowblower, I looked two houses down and I saw the neighbor shoveling snow and he had about at this point, seven or eight inches. I'm like, no okay. way, dude. So I went down there and he, they just moved from California. So like, he's got no snow implements. Yeah. So he's got mm -hmm. a little shovel and I'm like, no man, I'm like, I got you. <laughs> so <laughs> nice. I helped him, I helped him clear his driveway. I came back. I had another inch and a half to two inches on my driveway by the time I got done helping him. So I cleared the driveway again Jeez. And, uh, and now I'm looking out at it and I'm like, I got to go clear it again. So I'll have to, I'll have to snap some pics. We have a good 14 inches or so. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah, apparently we have another snowstorm coming tonight, and they're talking anywhere from like five to eight inches of snow. Yeah, I, I wasn't expecting this because we've had a few waves of snow, and um, we were supposed to have big snowstorms, and it was an inch or two, you know, kind of cleared it, and it was fine. And they're like, no, this is going to be a big storm. I'm like, yeah, right, like all the others have been misses. No, it mm -hmm. hit. It hit. Um, and we had UDOT um, asked to stay off the freeways until after like 10 this morning. Mm -hmm. um, and we got an automated call from the city saying, if at all possible, don't use the city streets until afternoon. Um, we're, we're having trouble getting everything cleaned, which for us is like, that's, that never happens. Like they're pretty efficient and we don't usually get a phone call saying, don't, <laughs> don't drive on the road. So um, yeah, it was a pretty big. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the problem is we, the, the, the geography is interesting. And just down the street from my house, there's like this swale type thing where it dips and then it comes back up and the wind howls through there. And I guess that little dip has just been buried in snow. So there you go. That's been my morning. Oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> and I just got done talking to, to Carrie at HBR and, uh, mm -hmm. As I mentioned, we we rarely talk business. So for like 15 minutes, we talked to cooking. And uh, I was scrambling to get on this call because I was sending her pictures of all the things that I've been making in my new enamel Dutch oven. She's like, nice. thinking about buying one. I'm like, oh, you have to do it. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm going to send her pictures of everything I've been making in it. So Nice, nice. Did, did you guys get a chance to talk business at all? Or still was it all just cooking? Yeah, just personal shit chat. <laughs> cooking, okay. travel, snowshoeing. She said that nice. Boston's Boston's got finally got a good chunk of snow, so she can break out her snowshoes and go do some snowshoeing. And I got mine as nice. well. After she got hers, I bought a pair, um, mm -hmm. and and they're hanging up in my my garage. So maybe if I'm not too worn out from snow removal, I'll slap on the snowshoes and go hit the trail. Fun, fun. Yeah, yeah. I'll take that over skiing at this point. I've never been snowshoeing, and every time I've tried to go skiing, a freak snowstorm comes and prevents me from actually going skiing. So, oh really? <laughs> it, it's happened several times in my life. I'm like, I guess I'm just not destined to go skiing. I, I mean, I I grew up a skier, and I skied all through college. I, I probably skied for 15 years or so, but then I got to a point. I'm like, I I, I love the ski resort. I, I'll be the stay in the lodge and have a warm beverage guy. I, I, I I'm done with the hill. <laughs> So. Well, I just think that when Omniture Summit had mm. the ski day, mm -hmm. the couple of years that I went, um, yeah. when they still had the ski day in, in Salt Lake, I would just go up to the mountain and hang out at the mountain. I wouldn't actually go skiing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's fun, but it's a lot of work. And especially if you're getting older and like stuff hurts anyway, you're like falling down and hitting stuff. It's like not, not too fun. So. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you know, uh, Summit used to be held at a ski resort. I did not know that part. I, oh, yeah. I, I went, you know, after it had moved over to the Grand America. I want to say it was even up in Park City a couple times. Um, but the first summit I ever went to was a, at Snowbird. It was amazing. I would love to create something like that, recreate something like that. 
So um, Snowbird is one of mm-hmm. Utah's premier ski resorts. It's up, it's up a little canyon. Um, it's it's not. Um, it's not a destination place like a park city that's filled with shops and restaurants and like as a city, it's, you know, it's a ski resort. It's, it's tucked up in this, this Canyon. Um, and that's where summit was. And so a lot of, um, a lot of folks would be bused in. So you would park down in the Valley and they would have a shuttle bus that, that took you up to the resort and you were basically locked in at this resort for two or three days. And, mm-hmm. um, it was awesome. You know, it was much, much smaller and more intimate. We had it, we had the summit at the lodge and had these small breakout sessions. Um, obviously with the popularity and the growth that wasn't sustainable, but I, I love that. Um, it was amazing. And the only thing like industry wise that came close to it was, um, did you ever attend any of symphonics, um, events? Um, no, I, I never, I never went to any of those. Do you remember what their event was called? Exchange? No, was it? Ex- no, it wasn't remember. Exchange. Uh. Anyways, uh, I went to one um, out in Monterey, and it was kind mm-hmm. of a similar thing um, in that um, there's not there's not a lot going on around Monterey, so everyone was there at the same location, kind of on the main street by the cannery. And it was just awesome. Like a smaller group, you stayed at the destination and it was, it was it. Um, and while I had a great time at our last Adobe summit down in Vegas, like you're in Vegas, there's a million things you can do. And so yeah. there's 15,000 people spread out all over the city. Um, you know, a few hundred, maybe a thousand people at a destination where you can't go out and there's not a lot of other things to do. It's just awesome to me. Anyway. Well, I think you you know you're, you've got an idea to start a new conference. We've talked about it for a long time. Um, we've talked about doing something small, and um, you know whether it's like getting a few cabins up at Sundance or something, and doing like a destination thing and starting small, like maybe fifteen to twenty people, you know, exclusive by invitation only. Let's come hang out for a couple of days and talk analytics. I think it would be amazing. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be amazing. That would be yeah. a lot of fun. Post COVID, we're good. We got to make that happen. Yeah. So. Yep. What is up with you? You guys got the cold, cold blast. Yeah, it was it was nice and warm yesterday. Warm being relative of like fifty right. degrees in oh, in, in February. That's but the, then cold snap came through overnight, and yeah, and now they're talking snow tonight. So. Okay. So it's gotten a little cold and like they were talking about like, you know, starting last weekend was just going to be like a string of storms coming through. So we'll see. I'm not sure if there's anything after this, but, um, I'm, I'm already done with the snow. (laughs) You know, I'm good for, give me a good, good one or two snowstorms and then I'm done. Yeah. I think most of us are like that. Unless you're really into the outdoor snow scene, Mm -hmm. like skiing, snowboarding, then yeah, you get a couple of good snowstorms. Like, all right, that was enough of that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean like that, that, that's pretty much it. You know, nothing, nothing too exciting. Um, so yeah, like no, nothing, nothing too exciting to report at the moment. Kind of like also just kind of one of those like blah days. Mm. Yeah. Looking at all the snow blah. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. I'm trying to talk myself into going out there one more time and clearing it and then putting on my comfy clothes and calling it a good a day. So Oh yeah, go out there, get the snow blower going and, yeah. and have some fun with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's much more enjoyable than hand shoveling. I have to hand shovel the back, like the patio mm-hmm. deck because I can't get the snow blower back there. But uh I there's no way I'm I'm clearing that driveway by shovel by hand. <laughs> it's just too much. Mm-hmm. Too much. Too much. Yeah. But um, I actually think that gives me a good segue into in, into the, the, the topic today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, they talk about you know, shoveling by hand and potentially making a mistake. I want to actually talk about making mistakes. Okay. Um, you know, and like I, 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 
it, it feels like there's, and, and maybe it's always been like this, but there's, there's always a lot of talk about people like learn from your mistakes and make mistakes and learn more and whatnot. But then at the same time, everyone seems scared to make mistakes. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's a lot of talk around, you know, the value of making mistakes, but don't actually do it. Right. Mm. I, I, am I missing something? Is that, you know, do you see the same thing out there? Meaning that people are actually scared to to make mistakes. Yes, for sure. Yeah, you know, yeah even though sure. even though some folks talk a big game and talk about the value of 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 the learnings you get from that, people are actually scared to, and, and they 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 they're scared to make a mistake and actually just try to keep. Uh, well, it's a it's a Silicon Valley mantra, isn't it? Like fail fast. Like yep. Um, that's that's it. It's out there, and people talk about it, and um. Evans had some, Evan LaPointe's had some interesting thoughts on it um, as, as well. But I, I think there's, there's definitely something to pushing ourselves. And I think that's really where the, the conversation is at, is that um, fear of failure, either personally, um, where we have just a fear of, of failing, is, is definitely prevalent. But I also think we don't create very safe spaces to operate in from a work perspective. Um, it seems like we're always precariously balanced on a cliff edge that, you know, one little mistake, it's like, do we lose that promotion? Does someone else sneak ahead of us on the corporate ladder? Do we get fired? Um, so I think that that is often in people's minds. This dog knows, <laughs> knows every time I'm on, she comes and stands at the door with her toy in her mouth and like looks at me and cries. I'm like, um, but I, I think it's less about making a mistake to make a mistake. Um, and I think that's, you know, there's, there's some conversation around that um, because making a mistake just to make a mistake, I don't think is the right approach, you know, cause we can all go out and make lots of mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's why were the mistakes made? Is it, um, are we making a mistake because we were lazy because we didn't go through a proven process because we didn't care about the process I, I don't think that makes us better. Um, it's it's the it's the mistakes we make when we're pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone is where we seek growth. Um, and I'm I've shared have I shared did I share the story the skiing story on the podcast? Speaking uh, of skiing, I don't think so. Okay, well you queued me up good for it, and we talked about skiing and falling down. So I want to say I was six or seven when I. First, my mom put me in ski lessons. So she would take me up to the resort, drop me off, and then, I don't know, four or five hours later, come back and pick me up after my class was done. And uh, I had an instructor that stayed with me. And um, I remember that I still remember it to this day. I'm sure it maybe is different in my head than what actually went down. But this, the story that I remember in my head is I was on the bunny hill. So if you're not into skiing, um, ski resorts have different hills and um, they're rated by how difficult they are. And beginners um, start on what they call the bunny hill or the bunny slope. It's a really small, gentle hill and, you know, less risk. And it's where you, you learn the basics. And um, I, I had gone down several times with my instructor and I was doing, I think it was my solo day. It was, he wasn't going to go down that one with me, and me, me anymore. So he was going to put me on the lift. I would go to the top, ski down and meet him at the bottom. And after one of the runs, like I was like beaming. I'm like, man, I'm doing so awesome. I was so happy. I get down there and he has this look on his face, like a disapproving look. I'm like, what's going on, man? Like I'm killing this hill, man. <laughs> it's awesome. He's like, he's like, I want to get off this mm -hmm. bunny hill, bud. Like I want to go do some more challenging things. There's a lot of fun stuff out there. And I'm like, so what's the problem? He's like, you're not falling down. I'm like, I, I don't understand. He's like, we can't get off this hill until <laughs> you learn to fall down. Because what you're doing is you're taking the basics of what I taught you and you're not experimenting and pushing yourself outside that comfort zone. There's more techniques to learn. There's more skill to learn, but you're not going to be perfect doing it your first time or your hundredth time. Probably that means you're going to fall down because you're going to make a mistake and then you're going to learn from it. and You're going to change that next time. If you come down this hill one more time without falling down, I know that you're not pushing yourself outside your comfort zone and you're not going to progress. And that story has stuck with me all throughout my career because it's, it's true. 
and we see it in our personal endeavors, we see it in our business growth, that we, we get into a place where we feel comfortable and then we operate at high efficiency, we operate at low error rate, but we, but we stagnate. And that stagnation is because we're scared to go to that next level. And we know it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be tricky. You know, we talk about this a lot with an ath from an athletics perspective, and we talk about the game slowing down for quarterbacks. But just think about their progression. A star quarterback in high school, the game is slow. What happens when he goes to a big D1 school and gets in his first game? Is the game is slow? No, he gets his ass kicked. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. The game all of a sudden sped up. I was like, wait a minute, this is the same game. Why is it so much harder and faster? And then you go from being a star in college to the pros, and the game gets faster again. And, and so each of these times you go to a new level of competition, of skill, of pushing yourself, you get hit again, you fall down again, and that's okay. That's part of the learning process. And again, I think the, the perspective of doing that from a place of challenging ourselves as going to the next level, I think is, is where the growth is. And I think we just have to be careful of saying that isn't to say we should go from level one to level 10. You know, we shouldn't go from something that we're good at to something we have no business doing. That's just foolhardy. Um, and it's also not saying we should make mistakes just to make mistakes. Um, if there's a proven process, a proven way of doing things, we shouldn't make a mistake just to say, ha, I made a mistake. I'm going to get better. That That isn't true either. And I think a lot about I, I'm totally into like pilot culture and, and watching YouTube videos of pilots and pilots have a very... Um, rigid way of taking off of landing they have a checklist they go through and they follow mm -hmm. it every time in order and to say well i'm going to challenge myself and not do the checklist no that's not what we're talking about here. that's not the growth we're talking about right in in that aspect it's i'm going to challenge myself i'm going to go from flying a single engine plane to a, a double engine plane or from a, a plane to a jet you know that's the challenge and that's where we make these little micro mistakes but we don't want to make mistakes that are going to be fatal to our careers Mm -hmm. just to make a mistake right so yeah anyway that was a long long way to respond to your your queued up initial question yeah yeah and and, and you know i think it, it's good to identify what we're, what we're talking about here it's taking calculated risks over um irrational risks right to, um you know to to continue with your pilot analogy it's an irrational risk to say, you know what, I'm going to fly without the the checklist, without the, you know, trying to change up the procedures on the fly of right. what I've been trained with and what people have been doing for years ahead of me. That, that, that That's a crazy risk. Um, but the more calculated risk, and all of a sudden I'm now blanking on a good example <laughs> to give, is what we're talking about. And that's what people are talking about is, is take that calculated risk. If there's a mistake, don't be scared of making that mistake, yeah. learn from it and, and move on. For, for sure. And, and one of the stories that I, I love to talk about is a story, you know, that we have with a current client. And I think there, there are two pieces to it. One, you obviously need a healthy environment to work in. Uh, if you're working in a toxic environment where even the littlest mistakes are put under a microscope and everyone's made to feel like a failure, that's going to be hard to thrive in any, any type of a circumstance. The bigger challenge, I believe, is with ourselves, that admitting to ourselves that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to know all the answers. And um, even, even going through the process, sometimes we make mistakes. And it's it's okay and we need to own it and we need to learn from it. Um, the, the example, speaking of, of Carrie at HBR, one of my favorite stories involves her when she was working at Staples. And I was uh, helping run optimization strategy for Staples. This was maybe 12 years ago. And um, I, I failed to go through my checklist. I had a checklist of how we do things. I got rushed, I skipped some steps. And I pushed a test out live on staples.com, which gets how many millions of visitors? A lot. And the, the mistake I made, when, when you make a mistake with analytics and data collection, it's visible internally. You know, maybe you drop some data, maybe some data is corrupt, the CEO might be pissed. When you make a mistake, mistake with optimization, you're, you're making a visible error on a website that 
thousands and sometimes millions of visitors see on a daily basis. And that's what I did. I, I pushed out um, a set of code to their homepage that put a black box over their hero image. So if you went to staples.com, instead of seeing a big, pretty hero image, there was a black box that had some placeholder text of test offer goes here. <laughs> and, and it was live for 20 minutes. Uh, the, t the most scary 20 minutes of my life that was live on staples.com. And that's a big mistake to make with lots of visibility, lots of people seeing it. I quickly took it down and fixed it. And I sat in my office for a good five, 10 minutes in a cold sweat thinking, damn, what, what do I do? Um, what, you know, what would you do? What, what do you think another consultant would do? Maybe someone young in their career. What, what do you think would be going through your head or what would you think about doing? I think the, the average person would be like, how do I sweep this under the rug? Yeah. How do I, how do I either deflect? Maybe it never happened. Maybe no one ever saw it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe no one ever saw it or how do I deflect? So this doesn't come back on me. I thought a lot about that. I thought maybe no one saw it. I mean, visitors saw it for sure, but maybe no one at Staples saw it. Maybe I can get away mm -hmm. without saying anything. And I thought, well, Maybe someone saw it, but maybe it's like, wow, this is Adobe's fault because X, Y, Z, or maybe this is someone at Staples fault, or, you know, it's like, I don't know, someone else's fault. Um, do you want to, do you want to take a guess on what actually happened? Nobody saw it. Well, no one at Staples saw it as far as I was aware. Um, so, you know, so, so if you had just not mentioned it, they would not have known. Most likely. I mean, it, it may have come up, maybe someone saw it and called support and maybe they found out, but chances are no one saw it. Um, no one at Staples saw it and chances are they may have never found out. But I went to Carrie. In fact, I called her up, said, I'm sending you an email right now. It talks about the mistake that was made. It talks about the potential audience. I did some quick analysis to look at sizing of audience that may have been exposed to it. It was a test, so it wasn't 100%. It was 50-50. So I did some analysis of traffic to the homepage in that hour and got a sense of what it looked like. I said, this is the potential impact of people that saw it. Um, these are the changes that we're going to make internally to ensure something like this doesn't happen again. And I'm sorry, I screwed up. And I don't know if it was that phone call or that day um, that ultimately solidified our relationship, but our relationship was never the same after that. Like, I, I don't know that we could do wrong by each other. Um, just the trust that we could have that conversation that that call built. I don't know if it could have been really built another way. So not to say you want to make mistakes to build trust, but in that instance, it, it created a extremely powerful and long lasting to this day relationship by saying, I screwed up. You know, that should have never happened. Mm -hmm. We had everything in place to ensure that didn't happen. It happened and I screwed up. Sorry. So I, I love telling that, that story because that's it's one of those instances where it, it just all worked out. And it, it may not always work out that that beautifully. But in this case, like owning the mistake, not only owning the mistake, you know, I think it was one thing to say, I'm sorry, but another thing to go another level and say, I'm going to be completely transparent. I'm going to share with you what's happening. I'm going to give you the detail. I'm going to give you the numbers. If someone asks you internally, you're going to have all the details that you can share. And I'm going to share with you a plan to make sure that it's less likely that that will happen in the future. I think that earned a tremendous amount of trust. So, so um, for those running an organization, yeah, you know, like there is, there's a lot of fear, whether it's legit fear or just, you know, people being in their own heads, yeah. you know, scared to either take risks, again, the more calculated risks, or when something does happen, the fear to try to cover up. And I mean, part of that's just human nature. How do you cultivate a culture in an organization where it's like, we need to take calculated risks. That's how we get better, yeah. right? It may not always work out, but we need to, we're, we're going to learn one way or another at the end. 
we need to do that and you're not going to be punished for doing that or there's not going to be fallout from it and whether you're taking a risk or not when mistakes happen own it like don't don't um be open with what happened how do you cultivate a culture like that it's tricky and it takes a lot of work um but it absolutely can be done and it's um, it's a lot of work to think about how uh, how um, to stay away from that, again, fail fast just to fail perspective. I don't think that's the right approach. Uh, but to be more strategic in it's less about having a vision of trying to fail. And that's my my that's my dislike of the fail fast mantra is that it's almost like you are setting up saying our goal is to go fail. None of us mm. want to fail. You know, we, we want to succeed in everything we do. So for me, I think it's starting with laying a foundation that we're not a culture of failure, but we're, we're a culture of experimentation. We're a culture of pushing ourselves. We're a culture of consistent and constant growth. And in order to do those things, you have to do hard things and you're going to fall down. And that's where we want the failure to be. In order to cultivate that in an organization, uh, mm -hmm. there's a few things that need to be addressed. One, I you you need to create a healthy environment where that can can plant and grow, because most people, uh, and I I'm pretty sure I brought this up on previous episodes. Most people have a fear of failure, um, and one of my favorite talks on the subject was speaking of Adobe Summit and Adobe Summit in Salt Lake, where Seth Godin was one of the keynote speakers. And he talked about the reptilian brain and the fear of shipping and thrashing. And that, mm -hmm. um, you know, as you get closer and closer to publishing something, to putting something out into the world, to, you know, saying this is something we did, people begin to thrash because they fear shipping. And they fear shipping because they fear failing and falling down. If I put something out there and it's not good enough, it's going to reflect on me that it's a failure. I fell down. And, um, I, I love that concept, and I and I love the the framework that he that he talks about about the reptilian brain, you know, driving your decision making, your process, and you have to have more control over that. Deliberately, you have to have more control over that. So I I, I believe creating an environment that feels safe um, and gets away from that reptilian brain driving the organization has to be the foundation. Um, but but really, it's born out over time with action. Um, it's easy. It's easier to talk the words. You know, we can all talk about, this is our corporate culture. This is what we do. This is what we believe in. You know, it might be a little bit more work to put it down in writing and say, this is our mission. This is what we believe in. This is who we are. But the proof always comes from the action. Uh, and that just takes time because it's not just once, it's every time and it's consistency in that action. And that has to start from the top down, I believe. And in order for that to happen, I believe employees have to see managers and executives and leadership being transparent and open to admitting their shortcomings and failures because we all fail. None of us are perfect. And so if we want to create an organization and a culture where this is um, accepted and not a scary thing and it's looked at as a growth opportunity, if our leaders aren't doing it, there's no way in hell our employees are going to do it because they're going to look to leadership as an example of what is safe to do. And if we see our managers making mistakes and them not owning it or worse, kind of as we went back to the start of this conversation, sweeping it under the rug, deflecting the blame somewhere else, um, you have no chance of making this work. So it, it needs to start at the top down. There needs to be transparency and there needs to be consistency. And they, the two consistent pieces are, as a manager, when I make a mistake, I need to own it. When an employee makes a mistake, we have to treat that with um, delicacy as we use that as an opportunity to teach and, and grow. Um, so the two biggest mistakes we see are managers don't own it. They often blame their team. If they're smart, they have a consulting group in there and they blame the consultant, but it's always someone else's fault. So if that's happening, we have a problem. And then number two, when an employee makes a mistake, obviously, oftentimes it's it's an opportunity for public ridicule. And, and we kind of, you know, how many times have you been in an office? I know several 
very uh, vivid cases being in an office where I sat and listened to a boss chew out one of my coworkers, you know, and it's like, that's not the opportunity. That's not the time to do those things. It's the time to have a more heartfelt, close conversation about, okay, what did we make a mistake on? How can we learn from that? And how are we going to use the learn, use this to grow and learn from that? This is a building opportunity, not an opportunity for me to play drill sergeant and rip you apart. So that, that's my suggestion. And if you're in a leadership position, um, I, I wouldn't say look for opportunities to take arrows, but that's what I did in my career. Um, and in fact, I had one boss call me into the office and say, dude, you don't need to take the arrows for your team. You don't need to be the martyr. I'm like, I'm the leader. I'm in charge. If they're making a mistake, then ultimately that's my mistake. I didn't prepare them well enough. I didn't train them well enough. So yeah, I'm going to take the arrow for them. And, you know, speaking of building trust, that built huge trust with my team and ultimately it made them feel safer to admit and step up and say, you know what? It's not fair that Jason's taking the blame for this one. This was on me. I made a mistake. Here's what I did. And here's how we're going to learn from it. Mm -hmm. So don't you find it ironic? A lot of these organizations spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for various testing tools to see it, you know, to try out an idea and see if it's actually something that works. So, you know, changing up the presentation and, you know, sometimes something they push out, it doesn't work like they thought it would yet. You know, like it, it, they're taking risks that way, but other risks that employees take are, are frowned upon. For, for sure. Um, I mean, like I, I see some irony there. There's there's absolute irony there. There's there's irony in the whole way that um, big companies operate because they operate from a, a place of fear, but it's not consistent. I, there's just lack of consistency because some things they don't and some things they do. Um, and a lot of times, again, I think it's unfortunate that it's the employees that take the brunt of the hit. And it's, it's just unfortunate. Um, it's unfortunate that they become the scapegoat for many things, but it happens. And as you rise in an organization and um, your potential fall is, a, is much bigger, you're, you're often faced with that ethical dilemma. As I become an executive at a big company, I'm making a lot more money. Maybe I have stock options. I definitely have a career image to protect. And so it's so much easier to deflect to deflect failure on my employees than than on myself or and i think in the instance of you know talking about a b testing and optimization it's so much easier to deflect it on the tool it's it's not a person it's not you know we can deflect blame onto that tool it, it has no future it has no career it's trying to protect so <laughs> yeah and and as a side note i i had a hard time not chuckling because uh there's a there, there there's a seinfeld episode um where Elaine's on the subway and she's talking to a lady and she's like, it's ironic, ironic, isn't it? And the lady's like, what's ironic? And Elaine's like this, this, we've come so far yet. Yeah, you know, we missed the little things like, you know, men opening the doors for her. She's like, no, no, no. What's ironic. What's, what's the word ironic me? <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> so sorry. I was thinking about that. as she said that what's ironic. <laughs> no, no, what does the word mean? Anyway. No, no, no. It's funny. Cause yeah, as you were talking. Yeah, no. Cause I was thinking earlier as you were talking is, you know, the same organizations that don't take the time to embrace a culture of employees taking calculated risks, understanding mistakes that are made, you know, using them to, to, to learn and grow from are also the ones that spend a crap ton of money to throw out ideas that are presented to the customer to see if, if it's a mistake or not. And try to learn it, from it. it. It's it's true, but in both instances, I think you'll find that many businesses manage to the lowest common denominator. And and by that I mean, from an employee perspective, we manage to the lowest common denominator of we want all our employees to never fall down going down the bunny hill. Okay, well we're never we're not going to make mistakes, but we're also not going to you know ski the black diamond and hit the moguls and you know make it to prime time. We're never going to be at the top. Uh, and the same is true of a, from a testing perspective. It's, you know, I, I have the opportunity to work with lots of companies from an optimization perspective. And even then, they're managing to the lowest common denominator because 
there is a tremendous Interesting. amount that can be done for sure. Yeah. Like I will present some ideas that potentially could be game changing. Do they come with risk? Yeah, it could, it could fail spectacularly. Uh, nine times out of 10, never get close to scratching them. Okay. Mm. Let's, let's move this button five pixels to the left. <sighs> okay. All right. Here's an idea. You've got tons of white space on your page, especially above the fold. Let's test better using that space to prevent relative and meaningful information to your customers. Oh, that's an interesting idea. All right, we came up with a test idea. Great, I'm excited to hear it. All right, so that button right there that's a shade of blue, we're going to tweak it down and make it two shades lighter. Ugh, all right. <laughs> because again, like it's, it's managing their program to the lowest common denominator in, in the sense of we want to keep this going, we want to keep skiing down the hill, but we want to reduce our risk of falling. And you absolutely will. You will absolutely reduce your risk mm -hmm. of failing, but you're also reducing your risk of going to a new level. So if you're okay with that, if you are okay climbing the little hill in your backyard, you're okay skiing down the bunny hill, if you're okay playing a sport at a recreational level, that's completely fine. And in fact, in a lot of cases, that's completely acceptable. But if you want to climb taller mountains, if you want to ski more difficult terrain, if you have goals of maybe playing in college and maybe after that playing athletics at a professional level, if from a career perspective, you have sights on becoming an executive, starting your own company, building your own brand, you're never going to do it staying on the bunny hill and not falling down. You're just never going to advance to the level of being able to do those things. So based on your experience, what do you think drives that fear of, of organizations really pushing their testing program? Is it just that they don't want to see their ideas proven wrong? Is it is it ego or is is it something else that's not, you know, really allowing them to push a tool like that and learn from it? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's at a personal level. Um, because for most people, and again, let's put ourselves in the shoes as someone working in a large corporation, I'm not responsible for the revenue. I'm not responsible for the company. I mean, uh, if we're realistic with ourselves, a billion, multi-billion dollar company are the things that we do on a daily basis are not going to change the, the direction of that company up or down. It's just not going to happen. So I think the fear of having like monumental impact, positive or negative on a business, isn't it. I think it's something more internal. Is it ego that I don't want to be wrong? Is it perfectionism? Maybe. Um, but I, I think it's just fear of fear. And and we see this, we see this a lot, and especially going back to the optimization example, rather than just doing it, we have to talk about it. And we have to get seven different departments together and talk about it. And we talk about this great idea that ultimately gets whittled down to something of very little value, but it's something we all feel safe about doing. And so that's what we push out there. Mm -hmm. And again, where is that coming from? I don't know because it's not like we're going to, it's not like we're going to bankrupt the company with this, this idea. It's not like we're going to fail so spectacularly that we're going to like find ourselves fired and never be able to find a job again. Like it's just, those things aren't going to happen. So what are we, what are we scared of? I don't know. I think it's just, we're scared of being scared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like I, I think back to something that happened like 10 or 12 years ago, the e-commerce platform company I was working for at the time, yeah, the, the, the design side came up for this great new interaction to drive people to a, an item detail page. Great new interaction to drive people for, to the item detail page from a product listing page. And, you know, they started rolling it out for clients and then they actually had a usability study. And the usability study came back and said, not only was it not great, it actually hindered the customer experience. It confused people. Now, this is qualitative analysis that was done as far as usability studies go. Um, and then we had one of the directors and products saying, okay, if we have this information, why are we not putting this feature on hold? Why are we not rolling it back? Or why are we not even at least looking at this, this feature and saying, how did we come up with this idea and how can we learn from this information? Why are we just continuing to, at this point, we're just starting to ignore it. 
Yeah, and and I think as I as you talk and I'm I'm kind of processing it through my head, I think it comes down to again at an individual level. I, uh, you know, it's not about the company. For for most employees, it's not about the company. It's it's a job. I almost knocked over my new lamp. You want to see my new lamp? Yeah. <laughs> and it turns on. Is that, is that the light lamp from a Christmas story? Yeah. Oh, that's fun. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and by the way, it came with this like really cool st- sticker book. It has a bunch of stickers from the movie. So uh, anyway. Oh, and one more thing. Sorry, I'm completely sidetracked. The box. <laughs> Came with all this like Fred G. Lee paper. <laughs> oh, that's hysterical! <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so, I, I, again, I think it comes down to um, each person as a person, and it's survival. I, I think going back to Seth Godin, the reptile brain kicks in, and it's it's survival kicks in, and it may it may sound silly, but I, I truly believe this is what is happening. Uh, you know, we're talking about optimization in this example, but I overall, this is what I think keeps employees back from progressing is this fear of failure as a survival technique. Meaning if I just stay out of the sights of the saber tooth tiger, you know, I'm going to be safe. So as long as I don't push myself too hard to make a mistake and I sit, stay out of the sights of the director or the VP of the department, you know, he's not going to see me. I'm going to live in my cave. Everything is going to be fine. If I push myself and try to get a little better and I make a mistake and all of a sudden the saber tooth tiger sees me and maybe he kills me and I can't feed my family. I think that truly does go through people's mind when they think about, do I really want to do this? So I make the company a few more dollars. So what am I going to get any more? Like, what, are we going back to the office space? So, so we, uh, so in a tech ships a few more widgets. Do you think I see another dime? No, you know? So I think a lot of employees think like that. So if I put myself out there and risk making a mistake, the upside is I make the company more money. So what? Do I make any more money? Probably not. It's just a pat on the back. Good job, Jim. You know, you launched a nice test there. If I make a mistake, however, what's it cost me? Does it cost me my next you promotion? Could, yeah, you could, it cost yeah, like me you my... could potentially risk, you know, risk your job. Yeah. Does I, do I lose my next bonus? Am I out without a job and now I have to figure out how to you know feed my family and keep a roof over my head? So there's this disconnect between the, the risk and the reward in that we, we oftentimes see taking the risk as having a reward, but not the reward that the individual gets to share in. It's a reward for someone else, the business, the shareholders, Wall Street. They're getting the reward of me taking risks. But if I fail... My boss surely isn't stepping in to take the blame. You know, Wall Street, the investors aren't going to, you know, take share in that risk. The risk is solely on the shoulder of the employee. And rightfully so. They are, they're fearful and they're thinking, am I going to have a job? You know, is that promotion I've worked so hard for now gone? So until we can balance out the risk and the reward at the employee level, kind of rethinking kind of some of my thoughts about how do you make this work in an organization, I think that may be the the nugget of, of of information that we need to think about. That the risk, the reward goes to someone else. The failure doesn't is all with the employee. All, all with the employee. And yeah, no, that's a good perspective. A it's not a balance. Because I'll be honest, you know, I'm I'm coming into this conversation with a bias. You know, having been part of a small team you know, a, a, an open team for almost six years now, it kind of taints your view of, in, you know, you're not part of, you know, Globo tech and you're one of 50,000 employees and you're easily replaced. For sure. Yeah. I, 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 for sure. I, I think it's a big challenge at, at, at big companies. It's, it's It can also be a challenge at small companies as well. Uh, we talked about this early on with when you joining. I said, by the way, there's three of us. There's nowhere to hide. The spotlight is always on us. So, you know, uh, you have to have trust that you're joining when you're mm-hmm. talking about small organizations, that you're joining an organization that's healthy from that aspect. Because 
it can definitely be challenging, maybe even more challenging in a small organization because it's true. There is nowhere to hide there. The spotlight is always on you. Mm -hmm. So you, you could very easily become a scapegoat for so many things. So again, I, I think it comes down to creating safe environments where, where people can be human and humans make mistakes. And we need to, to properly frame that as learning opportunities, growth opportunities. And that only works if we have the right leadership. So this is truly one of those things where, sure, as an individual, I can make choices on how I want to operate my life and how I want to lead. But this is one of those things where unless this starts at the top, there's very little impact an employee is going to be able to have in shifting the culture into a place where growth is focused and it's okay. And so, you know, if you're in a leadership position, that means I think the onus is on you. Um, even if it isn't supported from the top, if you're a leader, a leader of people, this is something you need to be thinking about. And if you haven't created a safe place where people feel okay falling down so that they can get on to something more challenging and create more value for you, for them and for the company, then you need to figure out as a leader how I can make some changes and how I can create an environment where my team feels protected and comfortable that they can come to me and say, Jason, I launched a test and it blacked out the hero image on the homepage. I screwed up. Here's what we learned. Here's how it's going to change. If they don't feel safe doing that, you need to start with yourself and figure out how can I change the culture of my team where they feel safe sharing with me the mistakes they're making because we're growing as a team and, and not as, a, as an organization that looks to pin blame on one person you know, throw them off the bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. And I think that's, uh, it's a, it's a great way to, uh, to kind of leave it, you know, at, at this point. Um, I, I really don't have much more to add to that. You summed it up really, really well. And, and what, what people can do. Yeah. Um, because I, I think it's definitely something that, that, that needs to be addressed in, in some organizations, you know, employees under su such a feeling of fear that even just the slightest misstep could cost them their job. I mean, that that's a very valid feeling that people, yeah. you know, or maybe not, you know, fear is not always a valid thing, but it, it, it's still something, it's, it, it's something very real to them. Yeah. And, and the irony of, uh, uh, of that is that it often creates situations where people make more mistakes. And, and then maybe I'll just leave it at that is that um, when, when, you know, we think that maybe we're motivating people by putting these standards in place that are unattainable. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to make, if the coach doesn't win 99% of his games, he's fired. It's going to make him a better coach. He's going to win more games. It, it's actually proven to be the opposite. We're, we're putting these people in very high stress situations unnecessarily and, and by creating this environment for our employees where they're always on edge, they're always walking on eggshells, you know, and the whole idea is that they'll be better, they'll be more, you know, focused and less mistakes are made. It's actually false that they actually make more mistakes and that by creating an environment where they feel safe and mistakes are okay, um, actually you make less mistakes because you're, you're more prepared, you're more relaxed and you can go about your job. Maybe you make a slightly slight little mistake here or there, but you're must, much less prone to simple mistakes because that pressure has been, has been taken off your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're, you're not second guessing yourself constantly. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, it's a good conversation. Um, definitely one very needed yeah, and it was enjoyable. Um, and I think, you know, lots of people that, that listen in or in leadership roles, take, take a hard look at, at how you're running your team and be honest with yourself, you know, and, and think, have I created a, a safe environment where we can be open and transparent? We don't have to feel that every little mistake is someone losing their job. And am I stepping up and am I standing up for my team? Like, you know, really think through some of those conversations. And if you need to make adjustments, it's okay to admit it. And, and start moving towards a more healthy environment for you and your team. Yep. There, there's, there's that view. And then I think also drawing it back to, to analytics. Um, are you really putting your testing program and your testing tool through its paces? Yeah. Are you really pushing it to do what it can do? Or are you just kind of coming up with small things just to make it look like it's being used? Which most companies are. 
Get out of your yeah. way. Kick, kick cool. the reptile well, we'll brain to the side and uh, and get value in what you do. So I'll go shovel some snow now, and yeah. you stay warm. Yep, yep, sounds good. So we'll uh, we'll wrap up there, and we'll catch everybody later. All right, see you. All righty, see you.